My first question, I think this, uh, this comes from obviously just knowing you as well and your journey, um, is how do you deal with failure? <laughs> I ignore it. I ignore the possibility of failure and fear. Um, because honestly, I am someone who's super critical of myself and I could pick out 20 things in a day, small and big, and view them as a failure. Or I can view them as a learning experience, which is what I try to do as much as I can. Because it truly is that every time you try something, you are learning from it, and then you are perfecting it from there. Uh, I truly think that the biggest failure is just not trying. Check. Um, that's a great answer, one Jay. Well, firstly, thank you everyone for coming out and supporting one Jay on this big day. Uh, it means a lot, and man, we worked on this show for two and a half going on three years before it ever hit the screen. So this is not, I mean, to the general public, like it just happened, but you know, we've been working on this for a very long time, driven the entire time by this North Star of painting a totally different picture of entrepreneurship than you would otherwise see. And I have gripes, I have a, Kendrick has a song, he goes, I got a bone to pick. And I got a bone to pick with Fast Company and TechCrunch and all these publications that take a very rare look of what entrepreneurship looks like. And they have massive distribution channels, so they take these little glimpses and they perpetuate you know, this narrative out there that entrepreneurship looks like a hockey stick. And you know, founder raises $5 million in 90 days, and like you hear all these narratives, and then what happens is so much of the general public, I've found, becomes discouraged from even giving it a shot because you don't feel like, well, you know, I didn't drop out from Stanford. I didn't, you know. And so when I was running my first company, I realized, wow, I thought something was wrong with me at first. And now on my third go around, I realized, for 98% of the general public, like the cadence and the rhythm and the, the path of starting a company looks a lot more like what the show looks like. And so that was a North Star for the show and we were really passionate about working with founders that, um, that we felt embodied that. So it was really a great pleasure to work with Wenjay. Actually, I'm gonna say my top favorite founder on the series to work with. Um, it's because I fed him every time. Yeah, and... Because I fed you those blueberries. <laughs> it was the blueberries. <laughs> and the reason was simple, and that is that you are inquisitive and genuinely interested in getting better. Um, and that was a real joy and a real pleasure, and continues to be. Um, so anyway, I wanted to preface with that. I think anyone in here who runs their own business knows that being an entrepreneur is like a spiritual path because it is so fucking hard and heart-wrenching and it makes you question yourself every second and yep. you have to just keep going. And what I was actually thinking about when you mentioned, uh, am, I, am I a business owner, am I fit for this? I think we're all like, to me it feels like we're all so obsessed with our own like brand in terms of do I fit this category? So I see this in food a lot. People ask, am I an organic person? Am I a foodie? If I'm not, then I, I shouldn't be eating this food. I feel weird being part of this community. And for business, I felt the same way where I would every day question myself, like, I never went to business school, you know? Like, do I, am I a business owner? I never called myself a business owner until this year. Wow. Um, because you start looking like, you compare yourself to everyone else, you think that person, went to, that's like NYU for business, they have this master's, they got all this investment money. I don't have any of that, so what am I, who am I then? And right. how do I move forward? So this is a trippy experience, right? Like to go yeah, through. Face, face, <laughs> and we have uh, at least two crew members in attendance. Is there anyone else from the crew that's here? Uh -uh. Um, so it's pr pretty special. We became like family. Um, what, like, I don't know. Was it what you thought it would be? Like, what has been the most interesting thing, the most surprising thing that you've taken away from the whole experience? I, I told the producer of the show after it aired, or after we finished filming, that the day before we were supposed to start, I almost backed out. Because oh, uh. somebody told me, like, it's, 
it's told to you that, hey, do you want to be part of this reality show on Vice? <laughs> and so when you think about it, like Vice, reality show, like are they going to make me look like a dumbass? Totally. It's very super dramatic. So I got really concerned about that the night before, and I was like, all right, fuck it. Like, I, I can't let these people down. Right. Um, <laughs> and I think the most uh, beautiful takeaway I had from the experience was honestly the crew. I tell them this all the time. Is yep. that I, I didn't know how good our food was until we would be off air, and they'd be eating our food, and <laughs> there literally people just freaking out outside, and I was like, what's happening? They're like, your crepes are so good. What's happening? These crepes are so sweet. And I never, I really didn't know how good our food tasted until I had that feedback, and um, I kind of, you know, they, they alluded this to this um, in the show that I honestly, uh, I've never had people really tell me I was good at stuff. Um, Really, this year was the first time my parents have ever told me that they were proud of me. So I've always kind of just done things just to do them. But to have a community of people actually support you and believe in you was so powerful to me that uh, it really, really did change my path as a person and also an entrepreneur. And it made me also understand my identity as an Asian American, like a female business owner, um, all these different things that really helped me like uh, just look at my life a little differently. That is awesome. And you know, being involved in the show, like that is the ultimate takeaway. Like that is the impact. Mission Wait, accomplished. Can I ask the same question to you though? Like did you have a different uh, experience than you thought you would? Um, yeah, it was really humbling to put myself back in the shoes of founders on the ground, scrapping it out. You know, um, and it was really interesting because when we when we shot the season, the crew knows we did several episodes in parallel, right? Because TV is very expensive. You have a 22 person crew, um, and any shoot day needs to be blocked. Like you need, there's no downtime other than lunch, which is just 30 minutes. Other than that, we're shooting 12 hours a day, five sometimes six days a week. It was very intense, and a business, you can't, you need, we needed to give you time and all the other businesses time in between the tasks. And so we would do one company and then another company and then and kind of push the, the balls forward on a few companies at once. Anyway, I mentioned that because for four months, just about my entire life was thinking only about you guys, your guys' success, like what would I do to further this business? Like, oh my God, is when Jay gonna, you know, nail it with this activation? Like <laughs> I was you really you know you? <laughs> uh, a little bit, right? You're like, oh shit. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think I think for for this show to work, like you gotta set people up to win. And it became clear early on to me like what your core strengths were. And so we built the episode around that as the win and we kind of reverse engineered from there uh, but that was the most refreshing takeaway for me was putting myself back in that mission critical uh, point my question this is a question that i i'm curious what you how you feel about it post this experience in general but how do you maintain your vision um, and stay true to what you see as the core meaning and, and purpose of your business while growing before this show, I was, I strongly believe that uh, you can build your own unique success, successes and money was not really um, a metric of success, uh, that the impact in your community was the most important. And I still believe that, but I also now value money <laughs> because uh, you do need money to have, to grow your vision, you know? Like totally. I have a really big vision I can't get there unless I can reach more people. And right. unless I can support our farmers, honestly, like it, every day I think about like, the motivation to sell more subscriptions is not for me. Like, I just need to support these farmers and have them know that their livelihood is secure because of local roots. And that farming is actually a career that you can actually have success in because there's a company like ours that's supporting them. And so, I it's definitely awesome. value community and sustainability, but I can also put money and growth up there. I don't ever want to be a Whole Foods, like that's not who I'm trying to be, but I, I want to grow in a way that makes sense for us. 
And that means having uh, really strong local communities everywhere we go, whether it means within the boroughs of New York City, or if we grow to LA or hopefully Mexico City, <laughs> that um, all those communities are as tight as what we have now. A lot of food businesses have gone out of business who have done things we do because they try to grow and scale so quickly and they completely forget that you can't replicate one city to the next. Food is super fragile. The operations are really, really uh, big and confusing that you really have to focus on all the small details um, and think about all the nuances. Wow, I feel like I love being up on stage with you. It feels energizing. Um, yeah, this episode ended up being the social entrepreneurship episode. It, and every episode we wanted to have a theme. And the interesting thing is that you don't know what that theme is actually until you're kind of a quarter of the way through and then some th you see a recurring motif and you're like, ah, this is that episode. And I was really, really pumped. I think the best snag in the whole season in terms of special guests was the, were the Warby Parker CEOs. <laughs> so to get them in front of you was, was really awesome. And we all cracked up when, when Jay sat in front of them and they were like, congrats on your business. She was like, yeah, you guys too. <laughs> I have to also say that when I, I, love that. Well, I, I got there and I was a little late because of the subway. <laughs> but then he, everyone, the whole staff is there that they don't always all show up and they're like, we're all here because we're, we're super jealous that you get to meet these guys. Oh, totally. And I honestly didn't really think about them. I was like, cool, they like make live glasses. But there was so much pressure because everyone else wanted to be in that room with me. Right. And the problem <laughs> is that I had two biggest fears uh, before the show aired. One, that I might fart on screen. Because <laughs> I'm like, what's the worst thing that could happen before? And then the second thing was that I would be on, on air and then I would not be stop laughing. And the day before, or two days before we had filmed Warby Parker, we filmed with Lauren Bush Lauren, who owns a company called Feed. He's, she's also a relative of the president's. Um, oh. And we had, oh. yeah, she's like a, a niece. Uh, we had a session with Lauren Bush. And Lauren and I somehow ended up in this laughter. Like, you know when you're at a sober party when you're 10 and you're with your friend and you just cannot stop laughing for no reason? We were laughing nonstop for 20 minutes and the whole film crew got so annoyed at us because they, you know, it's like over time, you know? Right. Um, and I was scared that I was going to walk into this meeting with everyone so jealous I was in this room with them. And, and not, just start cracking up. Yeah, so that was a little sad. <laughs> I think the best founders in the world have an amazing ability to keep things really simple. And there were certain words in that conversation. I actually was in the other room watching the monitor taking notes because I so look up to Warrior Park. It's probably my, I have them on right now. Like there are a few companies where I look for reasons to bring them up because I like them so much. And that is brand resonance. And it's tough to be able to you know, nail that. And so anyway, when they were speaking, I was taking notes. They talked about like delight, like delighting your customers, which is something that's kind of interesting to think about. Like what little pops of and little splashes of delight can you introduce to the experience where it makes someone go, huh, that's kind of interesting. Um, they use words like depth, which again, so there's a lot of layers to that word. Um, so just little, little things like that. But anyway, um, yeah, this episode was special to me because I'm a social entrepreneur as well. I run a fund that invests specifically in women and minority founders. And like we also have a double bottom line. Like our LPs, so it's a $25 million fund, but it's not $25 million of our cash. It's like we invested our own cash for a while and then we were able to go out to the market and convince people that diversity focused investing is not just a novelty, it's a business case. And so now we're asset managers in that we are deploying capital um, for, you know, on behalf of, of folks. And anyway, if you want the most amount of returns in the world, you go to first round capital, you go to like the marquee firms. We at Harlem Capital, we have a double bottom line. We measure purpose and profits. We measure the fact that we are enabling an entire segment of the population that has historically not had access to venture capital to go out there and create products um, for the world. Women can make stuff for women better than men. You know, people of color can make stuff for our communities better than someone from outside. Um, so to enable folks to do that has meant everything. Um, and then also to balance that with the fact that we need to make returns. So this isn't charity. 
this isn't, oh, like, you come from the hood too, like I do, like, yo, here's some bread. It's like, you gotta be hustling and building shit, and we gotta make money, but you can do well and do good at the same time. So this, this episode, I feel, really, really captured that, and that's why we brought Warby Parker on and so forth. So when you ask about growth, it's always the North Star of the mission, and then feeding you know, the, the operations so you can extend the mission. Awesome, thank you. What are some other things that you have coming up? Um, I'm really excited. I have been very excited since day one to implement everything that was taught and we learned through the show. Um, I'm excited to think about our values and to, um, to think about how our values can conveniently be integrated into people's lifestyles. So thinking about our customers' needs and really addressing those needs and then just by, uh, just by addressing their needs, we will be able to bring our values into their life and bring them really good food. So ways we're going to do that is just to create more content. Uh, John Henry's favorite thing to do is create content. Content, content, um, content. <laughs> and, um, but in focusing on our flavor, right, and telling people and showing people why our food is so good, you can tell someone, and, you know, food is something you can't really show how good it is, right? Uh, to help people experience the flavor of it, I feel like we can do that by having beautiful visuals of the farm, but also to be explaining scientifically why our food is so good. Um, because there, it is really special and it is really different from anything you can get, else, uh, anything you can get anywhere else. Um, so content for sure. And the way we're going to scale local roots is actually like a franchise model. So how can we inspire people in the community to start their own local roots market? How can we get other businesses to host a market at their establishment? Um, so that's definitely an idea we have that we're, we've been slowly um, executing and countering is in the back, has been helping me a lot with that. So that's really exciting. Awesome. My hopes for all of the uh, businesses that we feature is to, and also by the way, my same exact plan, because I asked myself the same yeah. question, like yeah. this is my first time doing this, so what next, right? And my hope for every single featured business is to dominate the airwaves, because your 15 minutes could last 20 years, or it could last 15 minutes, but the point is, I don't know about you, NJ, but I'm, you can feel a lift, right, in terms of your reach while you're on air. Like, and the executive producer at Vice reached out to me and he said, John, I think you'll find, even on the smallest of networks, the network effects of being on recurring cable television. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, it's lost its grip in the market, and yes, you know, digital is on the rise, but cable's still cable. And, like, I remember last night I was doing a panel, and while I was on the panel, there was a rerun of our episode on the air. And like you're gonna be sleeping and your episode will be on the air. And over time, these views compound and this single piece of content will be viewed 20 million plus times across various platforms. And so what I hope for Local Roots is like, okay, dom like dominate the airways in this time. Hit up every food blog and have them write features on you as an individual, on the company. Uh, I would even illegally rip this fucking episode and slice like little moments and, and distribute them and like Definitely. I would do so much shit I'm being on, right, right right like I would do so much um, repurposing of the content um, so that you can position yourself for the next big opportunity whatever that is yeah and I, that's what I'm also doing for myself. Awesome. I is there one piece of advice or words of wisdom that you feel like you didn't get a chance to share with Lenje that you can tell him now? I mean, honestly, we, we spent a lot of time together, so I feel like it all came out. Um, but, you know, advice is cheap. Advice is fucking cheap. When my team and I, when we pitched our first billionaire at the end of the meeting, my partner, who's supposed to go for the clothes, got nervous and he was like, he softened the ask a little bit. He was like, so we'd love to have you on as investors or advisors or whatever capacity. He softened it. And then this guy looked at a square across from the other side of the table and he said, advice is cheap, get the money. 
And everyone at the table cracked up laughing, but he was still looking at us, and he wasn't laughing. He wasn't laughing. It was like this moment where my partners and I, everyone else, it was a big table, was laughing, and we were looking at each other, and he was like letting us know that the way you get to this kind of impact is to like go for it, mm. right? And so, you know, advice is cheap. I'm looking forward to seeing Wenjie execute on that advice over time, and she already has put that into effect while we started shooting. So, nothing left to be said. Awesome. <laughs>